Hi, and welcome to our FinTech Lunch. Thanks for tuning in live for what I'm sure is going to be a really lively discussion today. I'd also like to say a massive thank you to Open Money who have sponsored the event and really helped us with all of the content that we're um, sharing with you. So for those of you who don't know, Open Money are an incredible FinTech company based in Manchester. Their mission is to make financial advice accessible and affordable to everyone. They do this by combining sophisticated tech and real people to offer the tools, advice and support needed to help people make the most of their money. So now, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you to Mark Robinson from Villang. Mark's also the co-chair of our FinTech committee and he's going to host our first panel. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for, for joining us today for the virtual FinTech lunch. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed your food. Sadly, my steak was slightly overdone and the souffle wasn't the best, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll carry on regardless uh, this afternoon. Um, so as uh, Nicola just uh, mentioned, my name is Mark Robinson from Balang Insurance Broker with Employee Benefits. And as usual, I'm joined this afternoon by a absolute superstar panel of the great and the good of the fintech sector. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce them to you now. Uh, so firstly, we have Rachel Eyre, who is the Business Development Manager at Midas. So Rachel specialises in financial, professional and business services for the fintech sector. Um, and she's recently worked on projects with uh, uh, Fibonatics, uh, Intrabay Tappet and Wonderbill. Um, Rachel's got a, uh, a strong awareness and understanding of what fintech companies are looking for when they're uh, either setting up or expanding into Manchester. So really, really great person to have on board this afternoon. So uh, welcome, Rachel. <laughs> Uh, we're also joined by Greg Cox, who's the CEO, CEO of Quint Group. Um, so Quint are a, a, an international fintech group focused on giving access to credit. Uh, and it also owns and operates a number of leading businesses in the consumer credit space, which includes Maneva, which is Europe's largest personal credit platform and marketplace. So again, welcome, Greg. Um, we're also joined by Leon Wilson, who's the CEO of Pollen Pay. Uh, and Pollen Pay are on a mission to create financial solutions that uh, really promote financial responsibility. So a really, really key uh, subject at this moment in time. Uh, so again, welcome Leon. Uh, also, we're joined by David Rosier from Deloitte. Um, David's a director at Deloitte and specialises in fintech and financial services. Uh, and David's got uh, over 14 years experience in the field. Uh, his portfolio includes Pension B, Totally Money and Tide. And David's also a member of the FinTech Wales Advisory Panel. Good afternoon, Dave. Um, and finally, we have Jonathan Farnell, who is Director of Compliance at Mark Millions, which is part of the eToro Group. Uh, and he's also a Compliance Officer at eToro X. Um, Jonathan has over 20 years of experience in the UK banking sector and specialises in e-money issuance, payment services, crypto compliance and operational risk management. Good afternoon, Jonathan. Good afternoon to you all. Um, so just a, um, a general rundown from me, and then I'll, I'll probably shut up and let you guys get on with it, uh, just generally about this afternoon. So this, this panel um, specifically, we're, we're, we're going to discuss the, the general fintech landscape, both pre and post COVID, um, if we ever get to a, a post COVID world, fingers crossed we do. Um, so it'd be, it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts on the, the, the current opportunities for the fintech sector in a post pandemic world. And also what you think businesses need to do or be aware of in order to A, survive and, and B, sustain growth and development. And then that will also hopefully shine a light on sustainability in the sector uh, and how businesses can create a long-term sustainable business model. A sustainable business model hopefully supported on profitability rather than just um, the, the sort of external investment channels. Um, and also we'll cover off the relationships between the main divisions of fintech like payments, digital banking and, and, and lending, etc. Um, so, so kicking off, um, kicking off then, if I, if I turn to you, Leon, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, how important is the role that, that fintechs played as an industry? So if we think about um, digital and financial inclusion, access to funds, that type of thing. How, how important do you think that the, 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 the role fintech has played as, as an industry across those, those channels? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, I think fintech has played a, a vital role during the pandemic. I think this is mainly highlighted by the simple fact that we need to embrace fintech technology 
and its advancements uh, across all sectors. So a lot of this is around, you know, the remote working and how to cope with access, uh, sorry, uh, like how to cope, I suppose, with have, having limited access, if any, to the supervisory and regulatory data and infrastructure and frameworks, and also on like how areas can be automated, uh, sorry, automated in a safe and secure manner. Um, yeah, I think I think it's it's definitely a crucial a crucial moment in time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you think do you think the, um, the 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 access to people having access to funds and, and that financial inclusion? Now, there's always been, uh, or there's there's traditionally been a, a sort of issue with people being, I guess, left by the wayside in terms of digital inclusion, financial inclusion. Do you think in, in, the, in, in the, the current world with, with what's happening with COVID and everyone being at home, do you think fintechs played a, a huge part in trying to bring some of those people on board that weren't perhaps as digital savvy or, 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 or financial savvy in the past? Has, has the fintech world sort of helped that? Has that driven that forwards? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, we've got businesses like Revolut and Monzo, uh, I suppose, and in our, in our sector is in the buy now, pay later sector like Afterpay. And these have shown what is possible using fintech. So you have the big incumbents that have been so slow, even though they've done it really well to sort of move in the current pandemic. It shows from the likes of Monzo and Revolut, you know, what is possible using automated systems and, and how important it is to obviously not only look at the future and I suppose keep an eye on the future, but how important it is not to just sort of uh, get complacent with um, systems that aren't automated. And I suppose with fintech, you know, we always have to keep one eye on the future and obviously we're ever evolving. And even though some people may get left behind uh, in what seems to be the early stages, these people generally pick up the pace later on, sort of the, 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 uh, the late adopters, I suppose. Uh, essentially, I suppose where I'm going with this is, you know, at the launch of a company like Facebook, you know, not everyone knows how to use it, but it's not a scary world and people will pick up and learn how to adapt with technologies. And I suppose the likes of the current pandemic like this, where it's forcing online payments and we're seeing more and more online transactions or contactless payments, you know, it's, yeah, it's ideal for people to just sort of embrace fintech technologies and, and not be so worried about any sort of online procedures, whether that's verification or transactions, it, it's, it's becoming a, a very seamless, easy to use place. Yeah, just, just to add to what, what Leon said, I think, you know, fintechs, played a role in across a number of areas, but I think one of the key areas where it's really been able to stand up and demonstrate its value is in the distribution of the government backed loans um, that we've seen globally. I mean, if you look in, in America, businesses like Cabbage distributed huge volumes of government backed loans very quickly and really responded in a way that other, some of the other big banks and incumbent institutions that you normally expect to distribute credit, um, you know, were, you know, were unable to do. I think in the UK, you've got businesses like Iwaka and Funding Circle um, and, you know, challenger banks like Starling have also distributed a huge amount of, you know, of, of C-bills loans over here. So I think, you know, th that's had a direct, direct impact on the businesses that have, have been able to access those funds. And I know there's examples of businesses that have gone to some of the fintechs in the, you know, in the SME lending space and borrowed off of them when they've just been unable to get hold of people at their own banks. So, I think, you know, a huge amount of, um, of government back supports being channeled through fintechs. And I think that's obviously been brilliant for the people that have been able to access it. But I think it's certainly really given fintech a moment to show that it is, you know, we are a credible industry. And when, you know, when a crisis like this is, has arrived, it's been able to play a crucial role within that kind of financial ecosystem. Yeah. So that, I mean, that, that, that kind of leads into and, and, and quite nicely answers my, my next question, really, in that um, it, it's, it's kind of impacted the shape of the industry. And I think it, it, it's really, I, I guess it, it's, it's, it, it's put the fintech sector in the shop window, so to speak, to say, look, this, this, is what, this is what the sector can do. I mean, in, in, in terms of, you mentioned a couple of, um, a couple of fintechs there that have been involved. Um, so Funding Circle, for example, in, in getting those government loans um, distributed. Uh, in, in sort of moving away from that, have, have, have there been different types of, of, of different types of fintechs responded in, in different ways, or has there been a uniformity response across the board? How how do we feel that, that the sort of overall reaction or, or response has been from from the fintech sector? I mean, I, 
my view is that it's been mixed. I think obviously businesses like Funding Circle and Iwaka had a clear opportunity in front of them to help, you know, to, to, to help the nation and also to grow their businesses and, and really prove themselves. Um, so, but I, th- I, th- I think it's very, um, you know, there are a lot of fintechs, especially those with larger revenue streams that have had their revenues affected. Certainly our businesses are in, you know, in the consumer credit space, you know, and, and the supply of credits dried up significantly in April and has been recovering ever since. So I think some fintechs have been focused on managing their businesses and managing a difficult, difficult situation. Another example of that is payments. We have a payments firm within the group. And we're very lucky because we're not exposed to the travel sector, but there's some fantastic fintechs and payments businesses that support the travel sector as well as other sectors that have been badly affected. And they've had to deal with that. Um, I think all fintechs have tried to respond with innovation and have moved really quickly versus certainly some of the bigger incumbent financial institutions. And obviously that's one of the key key benefits we've got you know, as, as smaller businesses. But you know, that said, I think the big banks have responded amazingly. Um, I was talking to I think it was somebody at Deloitte actually um, that was involved in you know the, a lot of professional services firms teamed up with the you know teamed up with the banks to, to work on the underwriting of the sea bills loans when you know when when it was a you know when it was at its peak. So I think the banks have done exceptionally well to move as quickly as they have as well. And actually, if you look at what's been done, not just in the UK but you know globally, um, it's been a it's been a huge effort between financial services and and fintech as a whole. Yeah, um, just to just to quickly add on to that, I think like obviously you know, the the banks have dealt amazingly with that, but I think sort of we need to go back even further to that and look at the the actual core banking structure. So even though they did amazing in the onboarding of an, an issuing of the Seabills loan, their actual core product is in even just opening a general bank account because of their whole regulatory process in even just acquiring and setting up a new bank account was dramatically hindered. So, and I think that's a that's also sort of definitely in the financial sector. What separates the the likes of the Revolut to Monza, the sign up process, because of a lot of the automated systems and the way that they verified, you know, shown how fintechs can really adapt to any given situation, uh, as in what what is essentially their core business. Because even though the, the banks, I feel, did amazing in in helping with the backlog, their actual core industry, and you know, people being able to just do day to day banking. You know, that, that sort of shows where I think fintech is is very much needed moving forward. I definitely agree that fintech has um, been positive um, at this time to so agree with all the points and just trying to unpick what, why compared to, so I work with a number of fintechs plus large, other, you know, other large financial institutions as well. Um, and, and clearly the difference is, is almost that the, the generic, dif- or, I'm sorry, the, the general theme through a fintech and almost the reason why I feel fintech exists is to solve a problem. And, you know, in the COVID pandemic is a bloody big problem, right? Um, and so fintechs are just naturally geared towards solving problems. Um, and I think that's why the fintechs have been better placed than most to, to help during the crisis. And picking upon uh, Leon's point there, and we see this a lot in the banking space. Uh, even before COVID, that, that movement to, to um, um, up being able to open bank accounts by embracing technology has been around now for a few years. So the likes of Revolut, uh, Tide, companies like that, you can open a bank account within five minutes. Uh, everything's done automatically. For example, there's, there's, a, there's a software company in Manchester which helps to do the, the, the checks, the due diligence checks using things like Facebook, checking your Facebook uh, footprint. Uh, the banks don't have anything like that. You know, still typically you go into a bank branch and bring you your proof of proof of address, proof of identification, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you've seen a massive movement now in the fintech space. Yeah, and uh, just on that on that topic, Jonathan, and, and um, in terms of sort of banks banks v fintech, if you like, and, uh, I guess we've seen more more collaboration between banks and fintechs um, during the, the the pandemic and. With that in mind, how, how have they been reacting together? I think the, um, well, uh, you're starting to see banks trying to adopt certain uh, technologies, but uh, what we see is that the, the actual service provision by banks is starting to change now as well. So interestingly, b- banks can no longer um, I- ignore fintechs for different reasons. Fintechs are coming into their own space particularly companies like Revolut, you know, they, they start off with a different type of licensing, which is slightly different to banks, but they can open up a different, offer a different service. 
So what some banks now are doing is their customers is not the end customer. Their customer now is actually the, the fintech. So some banks are offering B2B services saying, look, you, you deal with the retail customers. Uh, we will deal with the fintech instead, which is really interesting. Um, and so you, you've got these new companies, as I say, you know, we've said Revolut. Revolut is taking services directly from, from a bank. Banks like Starling Bank now they have retail customers, but some of their biggest customers are fintechs. So that that the dynamics are changing there as well. It's very interesting. Yeah. And yeah, just to just to add in onto that, I think what what fintechs are doing with with the with the big banks, they sort of forcing the regulatory and the compliance issues. You know, they they making the whole process need to move quicker. And yeah, I completely agree with Jonathan. You know, it's almost they are creating their, their own lane, if you will, um, by forcing the banks to sort of. Yeah, relook at the whole compliance and regulation because we can't have that slow process anymore. You know, the world is, you know, the world's speeding up, and obviously during pandemics, you know, we people need access to funds. They need to be able to do things in real time. You know, so sort of like the open banking, for instance. You know, even the likes of that is speeding up. Same day payments are happening more now. This technology has been around. It, it, you know, this is not new technology. This has been around for a while. I just think the use of these sort of neo banks, as I call them, or the fintechs. The, you know, the Revolut, the Monsters, the Starlings, you know, these are helping definitely pave the way into, not, not just in the banking world, but you know, across, across the board uh, with the different technologies available. I mean, I don't know if we're going to go into blockchain, but obviously that just being one, for example. I would absolutely love to go into blockchain, but sadly it's, it's not my room here today. Otherwise, I, I, we'd, we'd be here till tomorrow speaking about blockchain. Um, no, that, that's that's really interesting. Um, just just um, Dave, look, looking at things from um, from sort of Deloitte's point of view, what, what's the um, what's the external audit perception of the of, of the sector currently of the of the fintech sector at this moment in time? So I'll, I'll, um, I hope this comes across in the right way. So just bear, bear with me. Um, but, but I guess I could I could paint a, a, a bad reputation for, for the sector. Um, you could look at the control environments, which are lacking, sometimes not prioritized, finance, governance and, and controls are typically, and again, I'm generalizing here, so bear with me, um, lower priority than the tech development and growth of the company. Um, and somebody once described it to me as uh, uh, fintech, people in fintech um, and, and actually senior people in fintech sometimes have a chase the ball mentality. Um, so people are interested in the next new and exciting things, the things that create value, the, you know, the exciting things rather than the things that preserve value, such as you know, boring stuff, maybe like the three lines of defense or a having a robust control environment. Um, so historically, I think we've seen the sector as potentially high risk, high risk of failure. Um, now, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm being a bit dramatic, that, dramatic there. There is some you know, element of truth there, but that's probably more in the past now. I think the reality and realization, particularly now um, we've gone through the pandemic, is um, that's an unfair generalization. Um, I think the sector has weathered the, the storm well so far, um, and I think that strengthened the sector's reputation. And I think the reason why the storm has been weathered um, so far is because of the way fintechs are built, you know, nimble nature. Um, businesses can adapt very quickly. So it's really a testament to the general business model that, that fintechs are built on. Um, so in, in summary, the sector's had some reputational challenges, but um, currently it's a, it's a very exciting sector. Um, it's kind of like the sexy sector to work with now, right? It's, it's very in vogue in fashion. There's a lot of focus on it. Um, it's here to stay. Um, so there's, um, there's definitely a lot of positivity um, now in the firm about um, the, the fintech sector, which is, which is pretty exciting at the moment. And I guess sort of following on from that, and, and, and a, an open question to all: um, has as as what's as what's happened this this moment in time? So again, the COVID nineteen pandemic. Do we think this has has made fintech evolve more quickly? So have, have we seen more innovation during the during the pandemic? Has have people been forced to innovate more? Have people been forced in the fintech sector to 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 look outside the box a little bit more? Has that has that changed rapidly? Has it changed too rapidly? I think it's been interesting to see how, I suppose, how resilient fintechs, fintechs in general have been and how, how agile they've been to kind of, I suppose, adopt, adopt new products and pivot their business position, which is, I suppose, a testament to how fintechs tend to be built as more agile organisations compared to the traditional incumbents. 
So I think that's been quite interesting to see over the last six months. And certainly from the companies that we've been working with, and um, they where other sectors have maybe stalled and put plans on hold, the fintech companies have accelerated their plans. They they can see that they've got more more need to expand and more um, more impetus to expand. So that's been we, that's been one of our main growth areas over the last few over the last few months. Um, at, a very what is a very challenging time for businesses in general um so yeah i think their agility has been really good to see i think from what we've seen is that the 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 regulator has opened up the landscape for for licensing so even before covid there's some really exciting licenses out there now which are, are fintech driven leon's mentioned one already about open banking and we're just at the, the, the tip of the iceberg of where that's going to lead to. So you've got companies like even um, Amazon, which have an open banking license. Um, but what we've seen is we've, we've also seen a, companies moving cautiously as well. And that's in part because of, uh, for us, like the Financial Conduct Authority, they're doing thematic reviews now to understand how resilient businesses are given COVID. So... For, again, an example would be things like um, wind down policies, safeguarding how we how are fintechs protecting customer funds. So the FCA are really lifting the lid now, saying, "Okay, you're, you're a fintech, but show us precisely how you're doing this." And that's on, on the back end of some pretty big failures in the industry as well. So it's great we're moving, everybody's moving fast in fintech, but we're under the microscope now from the regulator. And I think I think that falls on like nicely from uh, from David's point about you know uh, the chasing the ball sort of analogy. You know, some some there's always two types of people. You know, there's people that need to there's people that want to fly, and there's people that are going to make sure we've got all the things in place that it's going to be a smooth flight. But I suppose you know we've got to we've, we've got to just embrace each other. I think it's really good having the backing of, of the, the bigger organizations to do sort of a lot of the due diligence and making sure we have everything there from a framework, but we need someone who's going to make the first jump. And I think that's what sort of really inspires fintech. And I think we just need more collaboration. And again, following on from where Jonathan just mentioned, we are seeing a lot more uh, opening up now in terms of the FCA and, and you know, three years ago, some of the payment in like some of the stuff we was developing, for example, we was having nothing but pushbacks and 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 a lot of legal talks um so so yeah it's definitely opening up more doors uh, given the, the current pandemic just to add to leon i mean in terms of innovation there's been a huge amount of innovation in the in the sector which has been driven by by necessity i think it's been positive that the investment community as a whole which let, let's be frank underpins a huge number of fintechs without that continued financial support FinTech would be unable would be unable to continue, and I think you know if you look at financing um, in the US, um, it was about twelve billion dollars in the last last quarter into into FinTech, which is the third biggest quarter ever um, from a FinTech financing perspective. So that that positive momentum's continued. I do think FinTech is going through a period of growing up. You know, we, there's been some great examples of FinTech being able to demonstrate its its credibility, but you know, I think investors have got more focused on long-term sustainable business, you know, models and fintechs. And, you know, we've all heard about some of the banks, you know, having down rounds or whatever else. You know, they need to be able to demonstrate how they're going to be able to support themselves on an ongoing basis without, you know, without a VC handout um, there forever, which which ultimately it's, um, it can't be. I think from a regulatory perspective too, the regulator wants to see these businesses grow up and be able to stand on their own two feet. You know, banks should 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 have the and big, you know, big financial services businesses should have ad adequate capital and, and profits and revenues to support themselves long term. And I think, you know, we're into probably a 10 year cycle on fintech at the moment. It'll be interesting to see in the next five to 10 years how the how the industry grows up. And what we should start to see is major incumbents that start to become part of the kind of financial services, you know, fabric and can demonstrate some of those use cases. I do think on the flip side, that you know we will see consolidation in the market over the next two to five years again investment you know businesses that have been through five six seven rounds have got to demonstrate that they can they can gener generate meaningful revenues and become profitable and at the end of what's a really exciting period there's a really profitable exciting business at the end of it i think all of those pressures are driving it you know innovation and uh, and a lot of hard work in the sector and it'll be interesting to see you know, how that how that develops post post covid and i guess some of the 
you know, some of the mitigation for maybe not growing this year or whatever ever goes away and how that investment community and indeed the regulator looks at looks at the space on a wider wider level. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that leads in sort of really really nicely to something I mentioned at the uh, at the start of, of this afternoon. That that, that that sustainability is obviously a, it's a huge topic, especially at the moment. So um, and again, you, you just mentioned there, Greg, certainly um, in the fintech sector, sustainability has, has traditionally come from either that external financing or from, uh, or from the user acquisition process. So um, I guess in, in, in a world where, where things may be changing in that respect, as you've just mentioned, uh, how important is it to, to sort of create that sustainable business model, which, which is based on profit? Um, so when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to a business looking to create those ideas or, or deliver that world-changing fintech thing, how important moving forward is that profit-based sustainable business model going to be? And I guess, and I guess, to throw in there as the as, as the million-dollar possibly unanswerable question: What does sustainability look like? What 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 is what does sustainability actually look like, and why is it important? Why is it going to be important moving forwards? And again, open open to the floor for anyone that wants to wants to volunteer to to have a have a pick at that one. Well, I I, I think I think sustainability is absolutely crucial. Um, I think profitability long term is absolutely crucial, and I think if if fintech is, is serious about becoming what everybody's hoped for, it's got, it's got to be built on long-term sustainable business models. I mean, fundamentally, if you're creating value for customers, you have a right to earn money for creating value. And if you create enough value, you should be, you know, you, you should be able to be paid for that and make a profit from it. So I think that you know, the whole sector has to be, and any, any business owner, or whether it's a startup or established fintech, has to have a clear sight on you know, a business model that's positive for customers and ultimately that's you know that's profitable and that's seen in the in the eyes of the regulator as you know as it adding value and an important part of the framework i think you know if if fin, i think um somebody said about fintechs are great at solving problems i think that's absolutely true and but we've got to understand how to generate revenues and profitability and sustainability ultimately from solving those you know those problems and i think it's fair to say you know there are some problems that have been solved, which are great, um, and they've been given away for free. And there are businesses that are, you know, aren't necessarily clear on how they're going to make money out of those customers long term. And I don't think the investment and continued support is going to be there, you know, forever to allow people to explore solving these problems. We've got to, we've got to build on what on, on where we've got to today. And ultimately, long term sustainability is key. Otherwise, you know, there's not a sector in the world over the last thousand years that's ever lasted a long period of time without making any money, you know, um, at all. I think we're in an exciting growth stage, but long term, you know, we've got to become sustainable and, and ultimately profitable. I think there's a people focus as well for it in terms of sustainability. And I've um, I've sensed change. Um, I've been with the firm for 14 years, but sensing a change in the new graduates that we employ. Um, when I was, you know, when I joined 14 years ago, it was about partnership, you know, no longer the carrot. Um, in some of my most recent interviews, we've had really deep discussions about the importance of being kind and helping each other. It's about the importance of, of personal values rather than doing whatever it takes to get promoted. Um, and it's about making a difference and having a purpose. Um, how much you earn is in a key measure of success in, in, in general now, I think it seems. Um, so I think there's a clear shift happening. People want to work with organizations that have a real purpose organizations that can help change the world, fix the world's problems. And I think that's a massive opportunity for FinTech then. Um, the general purpose of FinTech is, you know, is quite clear. Start with that story of a problem and the passionate founder who wants to fix that problem. Um, so on that basis, I think it's, it's easier to inspire people or it should be for FinTechs to join the business and, and motivate them to work hard and, and keep them there and all work towards the same goal. Um, so I think as a sector, you know, you guys, the, the FinTech sector has got a, a brilliant opportunity um, for recruitment and retention, um, as long as you can clearly articulate the purpose and the positive effect for society, which you know plays to is your business sustainable? Can you know the people in your business really truly believe that it's a it's a sustainable business because because they will get motivated and want to join you for that? Yeah, I think um, for me uh, it might be a little bit off here because I agree with what what the, what the panel's saying, but also I think sustainability in our industry is you know it's a very 
I'd say a taboo word because innovation is happening at such a quick pace. You know, yes, you do have to resonate with the change. And obviously the, the influx of now the millennials coming through, you, know, and, you, know, you have to resonate with this crowd. But this crowd will change its ideas in five years once the actual crowd grows up. And then in 10 years, it will change again because the crowd that's coming through now, you know, maybe have no kids. And then obviously as that generation grows and they age as a person, their needs and their wants change. And yes, the fintechs need to be, keep their eye on the ball and be very close with this. But uh, sort of touching where Rachel meant a, a complete pivot might need might need to be, um, even though it's not a very good example and it's not fintech, you know, the likes of Blockbuster, for example, you know, something something brand new could come through and and you it's very hard to plan for that, especially in, in the fintech world, because one piece of technology could change everything. We've, we've seen some businesses which uh, some fintechs have got some really great and dynamic ideas. And what they've done is they've taken the, the uh, regulatory landscape and come up with a solution. Um, but it's been too advanced to some degree and the, the appetite of the customers just hasn't been in there. So they've, they've been trying to sell the concept, sell the idea, but people are just not buying it. Uh, an example of that is, for example, like a payment ring. So you, what we call wearables, you, you, can, you can have a ring on your finger, which has got a chip in it, so you can go and pay for something just like you would with a debit card. Just tap tap your ring on, on the uh, on the payment device. You can even have a chip implanted in your glasses and just, just tap that as well. Um, but companies like that are really, really struggling because people are still saying, yeah, it's great, but I don't trust it, or um, what limitations, what's going on in the background. Um, so I think it's about balancing um, the uh, the demand as well, and and also coming back to Greg's point, we, we do see some businesses out there, and one or two of them have been named already. One of them is like the poster child of the banking industry, which has onboarded millions of customers. It's it's um, it is actually classed as as a unicorn now. But it, I think it's account dormancy rate. I, the number of customers are actually using it is something like 25%, and it's losing over a million pounds a week. So great VC fund. It's only been around for about five years, but how long is that going to sustain itself? And when it goes, it's going to cause a huge, um, huge wave across the industry, and it could even potentially give other fintechs a bad name as well. So you you you. you. Hit the nail on the head. It's that age-old issue of solving solving a, a well, solving a problem no one knows they've got yet. Um, and yeah, it's it, once you start trying to chase people down, say, look, you, you've got this issue and this fixes it. Well, if they haven't bought into having that issue, then you know it's that 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 one isn't there, that desire, that need isn't there. So yeah, it's it's, it's a very good point. And, and I guess sticking with you, Jonathan. Um, because this is kind of in your in your area. Um, when, when we're talking about the whole sustainability and we're talking about the investment and this, that, and the other, um, <laughs> over what's been going on, how how do you see that the investment community has impacted the fintech space um, for, for businesses of all stages of, of, of their lifespan at this moment in time? I suppose we I've, I've got um, the flip side of the coin there on both because what we did as, as a business a few years ago, we, we, we tried to uh, raise money through um, um, bit to bit of funding and, and it wasn't easy. So I know there's a lot of money floating around. We were always told there's a lot of money floating around, but we found it quite difficult because um, for one reason or another, not, not everybody wanted to invest or they were going to the, the, the poster child of the industry. Um, our situation has changed recently. So we were acquired by a quite a big organization. So it doesn't affect us personally as much, but I, I'm still told there's, there's a huge appetite. And I, again, I still see companies getting huge investments and, you know, they're at the, uh, the different rounds of funding and money seems to be flowing in at, at a fantastic rate. Um, but uh, how, how long that will be for and when do those um, people's risk appetites change? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, and then sort of looking, looking forwards um, into into the future, and sort of bringing it sort of more locally again into into the Manchester region. Um, Rachel, you you deal with with fintechs looking to set up and into, into Manchester. So 
Um, what, what impacts have you seen that the events of, of this year have had on the long-term future of FinTech? Um, I think the long-term long impacts will ultimately be quite positive for Manchester. So Manchester's been growing in prominence as a fintech hub over the last four or five years. Um, more and more companies have established an office here. I think we've got five fintech unicorns. Um, we were named by White Cat Consulting as the largest regional fintech sector outside London. And Savile's named us as, as one of the top five European locations for fintech. So I think that we had a, have a really solid base of fintech companies and also the supporting ecosystems, so funding, um, kind of access to talent, the universities, that creates a really a thriving sector. Um, I think as, as we've discussed on the panel, um, there's been, this year has been a very challenging year in a lot of ways for, fin, for fintech companies. They've had to, I suppose, it's been, I suppose, a survival of the fittest in some ways. Um, but I suppose um, thinking about it from a location perspective, it's been quite interesting because sometimes fintech companies will say, well, no, we have to be in London because we want to be physically close to the regulator and we can't, we, we can't do things remotely. It just doesn't work. And the last six months proved that actually everything can be done remotely. The FCA has pivoted to deliver more virtual content in lieu of, of meeting in person. So I think that provides huge opportunity for Manchester, which has got that really solid foundation of fintech expertise and the heritage of our financial services sector. Um, but we've, as a city region, we've proved our resilience th throughout this throughout this um, year. Um, and I think if we can we can build, we can really we've got a huge opportunity to build on that um, and provide an alternative to being in London, where it could be very costly and a very crowded market. And provide a, an opportunity both for I suppose for London companies scaling up, but also as the landing point for international fintechs, and um, so they can establish in a, a smaller but more maybe more open and more welcoming community. And um, so yeah, I think we're we're quite optimistic at Midas, um, and we're, we're we're working and speaking with a lot of really interesting companies. So I think we can uh, we think it's only going to increase as fintech becomes more prominent in general in society. Excellent. That's uh, that's very very good to hear. Very good to hear. And then you just you just mentioned there. You, you mentioned about the sort of resilience um, side of things. So um, just just Greg, turning to you um, for a second, is um, if we look at that resilience um, and and you as as someone that's involved in fintech across a, a multitude of territories, do you think the sector's somewhat been protected during COVID nineteen because of what because of what the fintech sector can provide? Do you think? Do you think that overall, the, the, the sort of relationships that the fintech businesses have with traditional finance and, and the ideas that people have got moving forward, do you think that has, has kind of protected it from, from the pandemic? I think, no, I think fintechs, pandemic's presented an opportunity for fintech, so it's had something really positive to focus on. In, in a lot of areas, it's not true for all fintechs. Like I mentioned, some of the payments companies that have struggled. So I think, you know, if you look at the spectrum of businesses, if you're in hospitality, for example, or travel, you know, it's been an extremely tough ride for you in COVID. Some other businesses at the other end of the spectrum, the Amazons of the world, et cetera, have found that they've been in a, you know, found themselves in a fantastic place. I think fintech as a whole has been sat, you know, in, in, probably in the middle of that spectrum and it's had a great opportunity put in front of it. I think that the reality of it is, is fintech is supported by venture capital and private equity, uh, you know, at the moment, that is the lifeblood of fintech being able to continue. And I think that the continued support and investment in the in those businesses during this time has allowed a lot of fintechs to carry on doing what they're doing. A lot of them are on a journey to profitability. So the fact that they're losing money, they were losing money last year, you know, and, then, and they've been losing money this year. So I think we've been very lucky. A lot of businesses have been very lucky that we've been well enough funded to you know to continue to focus through this opportunity. I think. But my view is that the, the medium to long term outlook for fintech is as good as it's ever been and has potentially got better. There's lots of sectors, I think, the medium to long out, you know, medium to long term outlook has changed. And there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future might look like and whether their business models, you know, are you know are resilient and are ultimately gonna gonna be sustainable. I think fintech's just got a great opportunity. And I was in a, I was at the um, Lendit conference in America, albeit virtually. Um, two or three weeks ago, and certainly in the US, there's a huge feeling that, lend, that fintech's having its moment at, you know, at the moment, and the outlook 
for it is extremely positive and the, the sort of wider financial services market has opened up more to fintech with things like banking partnerships. So I think, you know, it, it's a difficult period. Let's, I don't think we can avoid the fact that there's a lot of third party funding that's underpinning the sector at the moment, but it, it, it's been resilient ultimately because of the innovation and the value it's added during COVID and that ongoing support from the investment community, which are a bunch of very smart people that obviously believe, you know, believe in the sector. And I think, I think that's positive globally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then just sort of, sort of leading, leading from that and, and to, to, to bring us to a, a close for this session, really. Um, it, it'd be really interesting from a, from a selfish point of view for me and, and, and hopefully to, uh, to, to the, the, the listeners on the, uh, on, on the session this afternoon, if, if you guys could give some examples of how your business has responded to the, the challenges of COVID-19 over the past, what, nine, ten months? I've lost track of time, but that the amount of time we've been involved in this. Um, from our perspective, of, as, as Midas, we spend quite a lot of time out, out, in, our, out in our priority markets, meeting companies at conference, conferences and events, and we've not been able to do that. But we have been able to pivot pivot what we do and deliver more virtual content, which has actually enabled, enabled us to reach a much wider audience than we might have done if we'd just flown to New York for a week. Um, so we held a virtual fintech mission a couple of months ago, which was attended by 200 people across about 20 different companies which has resulted in quite a few new inward investment projects for us. Um, so I suppose we're still doing what we've done before. We're just doing it in a, in a more virtual way and hopefully a more accessible way just to, rate, to continue the message that Manchester is still open for business. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just to touch on a couple of things, I guess, I guess we've done. Um, I mean, from, from, an, from an innovation um, perspective, I guess our Manevo business is integrated with about 150 lenders and banks globally. And we provide a, a decisioning and uh, integration layer for them. What became clear when COVID, when, when COVID arrived was that a lot of the historical decisioning models and the way people were looking at customers were no, no longer valid. So. You know, we, we work with our lenders very closely to rebuild a lot of the decisioning overnight. We integrated open banking data into our platform in about eight weeks from start to finish because we felt that that was a lot more predictive on a customer's current state of play. Credit bureaus weren't picking up whether a customer had been furloughed or whether they had income shock, you know, with, you know, within such a short time period. So we've had a number of projects like that we focused on internally to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support what, what are ultimately our customers and make sure that customers were getting access to, to credit to about a million customers a month across the platform globally. Um, but, you know, aside from that, it's sort of more, you know, mundane stuff. We look very hard at the business and the different projects we had. We cut back on some projects, which we felt were nice to have and have really focused in on shoring up the core, um, you know, make sure that we've got adequate cash available in the business so that we can continue to focus on doing what we're doing for a long period of time. And just you know, just shore things up. We've, we've, you know, we've cut some costs as well. We've lost about 20 people across the organisation, and like I said, closed some of those smaller projects down, just with a view of remaining laser focused across the businesses to make sure that you know we we can continue to trade strongly and continue to focus on our sort of core long term strategic mission. Yeah. It's probably Mark. Just a, a point, not not from historically what we've done um, during the pandemic. It's probably more. A, point for the future um you know we've got a we've got a big team and just concerned about what the next few months looks like going into you know potential further restrictions and lockdowns um winter months for audit it's very busy between jan um jan and march but i know everybody's pretty busy at the moment so how do we deal with the cultural aspect of that so we've just been thinking about how do we make sure we, we stay close to each other we look out for each other we build and uh, foster a community and an environment where um, actually try and connect to each other more than we ever have um, rather than just have the transactional piece of, of audit and our work um there's a lot of cultural things that we're we're focused on at the moment to to, to try and keep our team happy and just gen generally look out for for each other but it's um it's tough and i think it's just it's going to change all the time so it's about being aware that um what works today might not work tomorrow um and, and just having the, the general principle of, of, of let's look out for each other we've done something similar so um we've not been in the office since uh beginning of march and we've also onboarded new 
uh, staff in that time who I've never even actually physically met. So, which makes it really hard. Um, yeah, I mean, that's great on one level because by working through Zoom, we've been able to to um, recruit people who are not in the Greater Manchester region. But we, we from an operational, we, we do what David's just said. You know, we have regular catch ups. We try and build that culture, um, and just look after look after our people. Um, from a business as well as we're trying to anticipate uh, what resilience looks like to us from a regulatory point of view. So we've been working close with the FCA, making sure that they're happy that there's not going to be any breaks in service that we would provide to customers. So just always trying to be um, mindful of what our responsibilities are and how those responsibilities are changing and maybe evolving um, all over the coming six to 12 months as well. And I think uh, just very quickly to touch on what Rachel and Greg mentioned, I think from a, an investor point of view, I think it's really important for the angel and the VC community to sort of touching on their, you know, the open up for business uh, because there is a lot, there are a lot less risk averse in America. So for us, for example, we're partnering with the likes of uh, Silicon Valley Bank rather than one of the UK banks because there's, there's more flexibility and they see this sector sort of exploding where we're only just now seeing in the UK where things are starting to open back up. So it's very crucial that we don't let, let fintech slip away and you know we, we try to retain a lot of it in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think that's uh, I think that's us coming to, uh, to the end of our session. So uh, I'd just like to thank uh, thank all of you for, for, for joining uh, us this afternoon. It's uh, it's been a truly fascinating in the world of the current fintech landscape. Uh, I don't think I'll be alone. It's hopefully exciting times ahead, and there's there's reasons to be cheerful. Um, so uh, thank you all very much again. And uh, Nicola, I will uh, I will pass back over to you. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, everyone. That's really insightful. So now we're going to allocate everybody into three groups for our networking lunch. Each group is going to be chaired by members of our FinTech committee. So we've got Julian Wells, Piers Dryden and Dave Gardner, and they'll help get the conversation going. So once you, you sorry, you're going to receive an invite to a breakout room, just click on join and then turn your, your camera on and you'll be able to get involved. So. Once your breakout's finished, you'll come back at 1.15 for our next panel discussion, but I'll just send all the invites out now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>